The Institute. Institute. Institute for Justice. The National Law Firm for Liberty. Hello, and welcome to Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, Director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. We're recording this on Friday, January 21st, 2022. Thank you all for joining us. We have a couple great guests, uh, IJ attorneys, who will uh, who will uh, give us a couple very interesting cases in a moment. First, a couple of reminders to our listeners. First of all, if you have not yet weighed in on our search for the most beautiful courtroom in the federal circuit courts uh, in the country, please feel free to weigh in. We're going to keep this open until the end of January, January 31st. And then on the podcast after that, we will announce what officially, objectively, the most beautiful courtroom in the federal circuit courts is. So if you, uh, as, I, as I've said in previous podcasts, if you have argued in a courtroom and you just thought it was lovely, um, or if you clerked on a circuit, and which we'll talk about in a moment, and you thought that this one courthouse and this one room in the courthouse was just, you loved uh, seeing arguments in that courtroom, please let us know uh, because we want, we want this to be as scientific as possible. Um, and so if you're a current clerk, even, and you want to weigh in, that's fine. Uh, that, that, that won't present any uh, recusal issues to us talking about your cases in the future. So uh, we've loved hearing from, um, from people so far on that. Also, uh, we have an event coming up in Atlanta in two weeks. So it'll be two weeks from the day we're recording this. It will be Friday, February 4th at Georgia State College of Law in Atlanta. We will be talking about the Georgia Constitution. Um, Judge Dillard, who is beloved by many, uh, including on Twitter, but also in real life, uh, will be speaking on a panel with me and Jerry um, Weber of the Southern Center for uh, Human Rights. We'll be talking about um, unenumerated rights and then there'll be a panel on various happenings going on under the Georgia Constitution and judicial engagement. And then we're going to have a keynote address from former Justice Keith Blackwell. Um, it's going to be a, a great event. We have a free lunch uh, and there's even a drink ticket or two available afterwards. So if you are a, a law student in the Atlanta area, if you're a practitioner, if you're just a normal person who likes listening to Short Circuit, then you will really like uh, this event, the State Forum on the Georgia Constitution. So um, if you listen to Short Circuit and you come and, and you, you want to talk about, uh, you know, tell me that you listen and you think it's great or you have maybe notes for improvement, please come up and introduce yourself and we'd, we'd love to see you. So before we get going, I'd like to introduce both these gentlemen to our listeners, Bob Belden, who has, uh, I think, a second time on Short Circuit. Welcome back, Bob. Thanks, Anthony. And Sam Gedge, I think also a longtime IJ attorney, but again, just the second time on Short Circuit. Uh, Sam, thanks for coming back. The last time you were on, we talked a lot of younger abstention, uh, and there's a bit more younger you're going to bring us today, right? That's right. The people need more younger abstention, and I am here to talk about it. Well, uh, before we we bring that to, to everybody, I you, both of these gentlemen, unlike myself, are former clerks on Federal Circuit Courts of Appeals. So, Sam, you were on the Eighth Circuit. What was what is your favorite courtroom? Would you say that you that you got to know in the Eighth Circuit? So I spent most of my time. I was in St. Louis um, in the the Thomas F. Eagleton Courthouse, which I think has the distinction of being like the tallest federal courthouse in the country. It has it has some superlative, um, and. I think what sets it apart is that many of the courtrooms are on something like the 24th floor of this skyscraper and they have these really big, great windows. So the the rooms themselves are nice, but not particularly noteworthy, but you get this great view just staring out the window. So Can, can you um, see the, I, the St. Louis arch from the windows? Uh, yes. I, th I think the court, courtrooms are on the four corners and it is overlooking the arch. Oh, so you get nice. kind of a view of all St. Louis and, and East St. Louis. So that 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 is my, um, my proposal for... Uh, a respectable and, and nice federal courtroom. And Bob, what, what about down south in the fifth? You know, I would have to give it to the in bank courtroom uh, in the John Minor Wisdom John Minor Wisdom Courthouse down in New Orleans. Um, I, I have to confess, my uh, presence in federal courts of appeals as a practicing lawyer has been 
uh, relatively limited, so I don't have much to compare it to. But the uh, the in bank courtroom, uh, we had a few in bank uh, sittings when I was a clerk, and to to see all of the then seventeen judges in the same room at at one time was really uh, quite the experience. So I noticed you're saying in bank is that is that a, a Fifth Circuit dialect thing? Or, or th- there's no bonk coming out of your mouth, I notice. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I think I first read the word before I knew anybody who had said it. And uh, it was just formed that way in my mind. And now I, now I say it that way, I guess. I, I say it that way too, though. So, Anthony, I'm not sure. Really? If, yeah, and bank. On, it's on bonk. We're, we're going to have to have, you know, uh, another scientific... Um, uh, contest about this because that there, I just I, I haven't come across this dif- disagreement before, but it seems to be widespread. How do you say? How do you refer to the process of uh, jury selection? How do you say that? Oh uh, well, here we go. Voidir. Voidir. Yeah. Well, I mean, Texas is vordire, but I think I say <laughs> I think I say voidir. My favorite on these uh, Latin uh, pronunciations is in Georgia. Uh, where you, I, I had one case where we had to go for a certain type of writ, and it, it's in uh, N I S I. I mean, I, a lot of jurisdictions have that kind of writ, and there they say nice I. I can't even remember what the first word is, but it ends nice I. Oh, that's great. Um, well, that'll be a, that can be a future podcast. But today, uh, Bob, you're going to bring us something um, from the Eleventh Circuit, where where uh, Atlanta is on um, what's going on in people's yards. So if you can tell us a little bit about that. Right. So the case is uh, McClendon versus Long, and it uh, comes out of the 11th Circuit. And the the facts uh, arise out of but- Butts County, uh, Georgia, which is about 40 miles southeast of Atlanta. And um, around Halloween 2018, the uh, county sheriff and two of his deputies – went to the homes of all of the registered sex offenders in the county and put signs like little sort of campaign or yard signs uh, next to the mailboxes in all 57 of these people's yards that essentially had a warning sign and said, you know, do not trick or treat here. Um, Along with that street sign or along with the yard sign, the sheriff or the deputies left leaflets with the people who lived in the homes telling them they couldn't remove the signs and that the signs belonged to the sheriff and only the sheriff could take them away. Uh, And and there was some evidence at the district court level that the sheriff also said uh, the homeowners couldn't put up a competing sign. Uh, That really wasn't resolved. But in any event, the signs go up for Halloween 2018 And the signs are taken down the day after Halloween. And when Halloween 2019 rolls around, three of the registered sex offenders in this county, all of whom are, um, according to the record, totally rehabilitated and don't pose any risk of uh, any elevated risk of recidivism, they file uh, a federal lawsuit claiming that the uh, sheriff's sign in their yards uh, it is a form of compelled government speech, and it violates their um, violates their First Amendment right not to have to speak on an issue. And um, the district court uh, ultimately gave a preliminary injunction, so the signs did not go up in 2019. But at uh, a, a later hearing on summary judgment and. Uh, the request for permanent injunction, the district court concluded that there was no compelled speech and therefore uh, no First Amendment issue. And the three plaintiffs here appealed to the 11th Circuit, which sort of ran through a a quick recitation of the facts and then resolved two issues. And the first is an analysis of whether these yard signs were actually compelled government speech. And the second issue was whether uh, that compelled speech satis- satisfied strict scrutiny. And the the first question on compelled speech was resolved pretty quickly uh, by looking at an old Supreme, well, 
not old, but a Supreme Court case called Woolley versus Maynard, where uh, New Hampshire was prohibited from uh, prosecuting a New Hampshire state resident who had covered up the state motto on his license plate that said, live free or die. Um, the Supreme Court said the First Amendment really embodies a an individual freedom of mind, which encompasses both the freedom of speech and the freedom to remain silent and not offer speech on uh, on a subject. And so the Eleventh Circuit ran through the district court's analysis and said there were basically two flaws in the district court's reasoning. And the first was the the district court had this idea that. Uh, there's compelled speech only if a reasonable observer would think that the private citizen endorses the government speech. And so it's kind of straightforward that none of these folks would endorse a, <laughs> endorse a government message that they are dangerous. And uh, the second issue was kind of a follow on of that mistake. Uh, the district court said, you know, these people could put up a sign right next to it that says, I disavow this government speech or this isn't true or, you know, whatever the other sign might say. And then people would understand you don't endorse the first, the first government message. And the 11th circuit said, you know, there's no endorsement requirement one and two, either of those signs violates the, the homeowner's right not to speak on an issue. So this was a compelled uh, a form of compelled speech. And so you had to move on to the strict scrutiny analysis. And everybody agreed that the compelling government interest, and I'm sure listeners know, but under strict scrutiny, you have to have a compelling government interest and whatever government action you're taking has to be narrowly tailored to serving that compelling government interest. Nobody disputed whether protecting kids from uh, sex offenders is a compelling government interest. So that was conceded by everybody. But the uh, government's action, the the sheriff's action here fa failed strict scrutiny because it wasn't narrowly tailored. And this is kind of an interesting contrast to the test that we normally see in many of our cases, the, the rational basis test. Um, in this strict scrutiny, the court looked at the actual evidence and what had been happening in the county before Halloween 2018 and said, you know, you haven't had any issues with reoffenders. Uh, your previous system of just asking these folks to put a sign on their door, you, you haven't shown that there's any problem with that. Uh, you haven't shown that these signs will actually prevent anybody from coming up to the home. A and uh, ultimately, the the 11th Circuit concludes that there is no narrow tailoring and they uh, the the court really uh, puts the onus on the the sheriff and his deputies to come forward with actual evidence that uh, what they were doing promoted this goal, and so that that sort of resolved the whole thing. But I think there's a very interesting bit at the end where the sheriff says, uh, uh, "You know, I did not actually put these signs on people's property. I put it on a public right of way that you know I, I can put these signs on." And unlike in the rational basis test, the 11th Circuit said, uh, well, you haven't provided us any evidence that you have an easement, that the easement is for this purpose, or that you did any research about this before you just went and put the signs up. And in looking at the evidence, the, the 11th Circuit actually points out that the sheriff provided like Google Maps printouts that had handwriting on them, and none of the handwriting indicated what the lines or anything meant. So um, the Eleventh Circuit said the the right of way issue was just uh, a non starter. And so, um, as to one of the plaintiffs, the Eleventh Circuit uh, reversed and essentially rendered summary judgment for that plaintiff uh, on the First Amendment claim, and the other two plaintiffs. There's an issue about whether or not they own the property or have a, uh, a tenancy or lease right to be there. Uh, the, the properties are owned by their parents and they live with their parents, but it's not clear that they have 
not clear that they have standing to complain about compelled speech on their parents' property, even though they live there. So uh, those two uh, fellas' claims are being remanded to the district court. So that's the uh, that's the case of uh, McClendon versus Long. And Sam, uh, how does this compare with your experience on on how um, trick or treaters are, are are treated? Um, well, I, I'm usually been kind of on the on the trick or treat requesting side lately in recent years um, with my kids, not not personally. I, I mean, I, I I eat the candy after you leave the, the bowl out and and go out w- with them. That, that's generally my experience. Yeah, that's the move. I like how that's the bowl the is now. either untouched or completely empty. There's no in between. But yep. anyway, that's a yep. pet peeve of my neighbors. So, um, yep. you're do do you follow? Uh, I mean, do, do you agree with the analysis of the Eleventh Circuit? I'm sure you agree with the result, but the the analysis the Eleventh Circuit had on the the First Amendment issues. Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly strikes me uh, as reasonable. I mean, the one thing that that kind of struck me was um, one. Like to to the easement point, like if the sheriff really wants to single these people out, there are so many other ways that he could go about doing it, right? I mean, he had the Facebook post, which seemed to be almost like a key part of conveying, you know, this warning to people because the sign itself didn't say, you know, there's a sex offender here. It just said, don't trick or treat here. You had to go to the Facebook page to figure out what's going on. He can he can really, as far as the First Amendment is concerned, post whatever he wants on his Facebook page. Um, and I was also wondering, I mean, I feel like there's like sidewalk chalk or sidewalk paint. Couldn't he just like paint the sign on the public road right outside their house, and and then you're you're away from the you know hand drawn Google Maps easement problem. Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah. I mean, it really seemed like it's hard. I think to to find a case where the the registered sex offenders seem like they're getting a raw deal, right? Like people aren't all that sympathetic to to sex offenders. Um, but this really just seemed like kind of a weird thing for this one small town sheriff to do. I mean, you know, there are sex offenders in most cities in the nation, and there doesn't seem to be this epidemic of like issues surrounding Halloween. Um, so, I mean, I, I think kind of the the gut level reaction of the Eleventh Circuit was that this is kind of a an out of left field, you know, governmental action, and there doesn't really seem to be a super persuasive reason for it. And one one interesting thing about where the case could have gone is there was. Right. There's a footnote near the beginning of the opinion that says there was a takings claim brought. And I think also a Fourth Amendment claim. Is that right, Bob? Because this would be an, maybe an a, a unreasonable seizure. Yeah, there was a state law trespass claim and a takings claim. Right. And I mean, really what it feels like is uh, is some kind of trespass or or taking that has constitutional implications because it's the the sheriff doing it. Um, I guess you could have a really weird result then if it's a taking that sheriff has to pay damages, which I don't know what the damages would would be here. I mean, much more reputation thing than a property rights thing. So um, the First Amendment seems like the most natural way to deal with this, which really is just a um, atrocious, atrocious, atrocious use of, of government power um, where there's all kinds of better ways to, to deal with that. Um, but I will say that I, I'm a little confused by the standing at the end. So the one guy owns his house. Mm-hmm. So he has standing to say, essentially, um, you can't have compelled speech on my property. If you're a, but I have, if you're a tenant of the house, you know, if you were a tenant and the landlord didn't say you, they could or couldn't go on there, seems that there's some kind of property interest that you would have to keep that compelled speech off where the you know the compelled speech obviously is directed at the tenant um now if the landlord said yes you totally can put that sign there i think that's different but if the landlord obviously there's nothing in the record that the sheriff had permission from the landlord uh who in this case is their their parents um so that that struck me a little bit odd as as far as the, it, it's not worth fighting about because the one won and so that means everyone wins the presidential opinion but um it's still uh, i thought it was a li- something a little off there i, I think that uh, i may have been unclear but the the 11th circuit says that there's just it's not clear from the record what the nature of the plaintiff's interest is and they say like you know do they have a, a lease or a tenancy interest and i my my impression from the opinion was that if they had been formally tenants with a, a landlord, they could complain uh, about the signs being placed there. And they their their 
plan to resolve the issue at the trial court level is to amend the complaint and add their parents. Uh, yeah, well, that takes plaintiffs. care of it anyway, because the because they're owners. Um, yeah, it seemed pretty clear. I mean, it seemed to if if you're living with your parents, you are a tenant of some kind. Um, I can't remember them all from property law. You know, the the the, 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 the tenant who stays over and is allowed, or what they're called, but. I'm sure law students right now are like, you can't, you don't remember that. Well, yeah, it's been a while, guys. Um, but in, in, in any case, yeah, there are t- just two things I want to touch on, and both related. There are some interesting parts of what the sheriff did here. The Facebook post I forgot to mention that he uh, incorrectly states that Georgia law prohibits registered sex offenders from participating in Halloween, including by putting up decorations on their home. Turns out that's not an accurate statement of Georgia law. Uh, and the second part, the the right-of-way part, is kind of funny because the 11th Circuit looks at a state law that says no person can put a sign on a right-of-way unless they have uh, authority from the, the local legislature. And the sheriff confesses that, oh, yeah, I, there's no ordinance that allowed me to do this, but this statute doesn't apply to me. It only applies to private people. And uh, that is something we come across a lot, I think, in our practice, the uh, the rules for thee, not for me. Right. Uh, and those were little treats in the opinion here. I think the treat the sheriff probably is ultimately looking for is to be reelected. And and this is a way to, uh, to, to get some votes. And, you know, he's probably right about that. Hard to argue. Uh, sex offenders usually don't, uh, be, be nice to them usually doesn't sell very well with the general public, but, uh, perhaps his, his overreach on, on the first amendment will be different here. Well, another, uh, group that often are elected are state judges of various kinds, including in Texas and Sam, something is going on in Dallas, Texas with the jails and the judges, and how to um, have the Eighth Amendment's restriction on reasonable bail be actually enforced. The Fifth Circuit released an opinion last week that's 77 pages long. It's on bonk or on uh, bank, whatever we want to say. Um, and I have to say, I read the opinion. I, I did go to law school. I've worked as a lawyer. I've read a lot of opinions for this podcast. I think I was the most confused of any opinion we've ever talked about on Short Circuit um, by this this one. I have no idea what's going on. Can you help me? No, I, I honestly, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna do my best, Anthony. Um, may, maybe Bob can help as well. Um, no chance. Th- I mean, this this is this is really something. Um, so kind of in good faith, I wanted to come on here and and say some intelligent things. So yesterday I went on Pacer and I thought, you know, I'm just going to read the appellate briefing here and maybe that'll kind of help me, cue me into what's going on here. And there was no joke, something like a thousand pages of briefing in the appeal alone. Um, there was like three sets of government briefs, all sorts of amicus. Um, so I didn't even, I didn't even bother. And then I tried to listen to the oral argument on the fifth circuit website and, uh, the, that webpage wasn't working. So <laughs> we're, we're kind of fl- flying by the seat of our pants here a little bit, but on, on the merits, you're right. So, you know, this case involves this kind of really important and recurring issue in Texas, um, about, you know, wealth based, um, you know, pretrial detention. Um, so the way that bail is supposed to work is that it, it shouldn't be a case where, you know, rich people get to kind of buy their way out of jail and the poor people get stuck there. And the only reason they're stuck there, it's not because they're a threat to society, not because we're worried they won't show up for trial, but just because they can't afford, you know, the, the amount of money that the court sets. It has to be, you know, an individualized determination. Um, the way it was working in Dallas, though, um, and Houston for a while, was that the courts set this bail schedule, and the district court in this case described it as a menu. And it really was this kind of paint-by-numbers uh, regime where the magistrate judges would, you know, look at the crime that the person in front of them had been charged with, and there would just be basically a dollar figure next to it saying, you know, this is this is the amount of money you have to pay if you want to get out of jail, um, you know, before your, your first hearing. Hearing. And 
There was really no exercise of discretion or individualized consideration. And it, I think if you go on YouTube, you can see a compilation of, of videos of some of these hearings, and they really are just a, an assembly line of um, these magistrate judges just churning through people in these 30-second hearings. People aren't getting a chance to have their say. And so, you know, a, a, a nonprofit group um, representing a bunch of these folks filed a, a class action challenging it. Um, they did that in Houston and in this case in Dallas. And in, in both instances, the, the district courts agree that there's some really serious equal protection problems here uh, because you have, you know, people who are remaining in jail purely because they're indigent, whereas they're kind of richer counterparts who have committed the same crimes are getting out. Which the Supreme Court has said is flatly unconstitutional, that you, you if you're indigent, you can't be jailed just because you can't pay. That can't be the only reason. Exactly right. That's the Bearden case from the 70s or 80s, I think it was. Um, so there's really serious problems here. And it's, you know, on a really breathtaking systemic level, this is affecting, you know, tons of people. That's why these are class actions. Um, and in the, the Houston case a couple of years ago, it went up to the Fifth Circuit and a panel said, yeah, this is a major problem. And the preliminary injunction had to be tinkered with a little bit, but but this is something that the federal courts absolutely should be in the business of, of putting a stop to. And so you kind of might have expected something similar to happen here when, you know, a similar challenge was brought in Dallas. Um, but what happens is, you know, they get up to the Fifth Circuit, um, you know, a panel you know, largely says, okay, we're going to follow the, the Houston panel decision and say that this isn't okay. You can't just keep people in jail because they can't afford to pay their way out, um, at which case the case goes and bank and, and, you know, lots more briefing is filed, which, which one day maybe, maybe I'll read. And w where we end up is just this kind of procedural quagmire uh, with the case going back down. And there's a lot in the, in the 77 pages, a lot of it I'm not particularly interested in, you know, whether, you know, county judges in Texas or state or local officials and, and stuff like that. Um, but the one thing that really jumped out at me was the introduction of this concept of younger abstention. And um, maybe it makes sense to pause for like 30 seconds and explain what younger abstention is because it sounds boring. Um, and doctrinally, you know, sometimes it is boring. But as this case demonstrates, I think it's actually vitally important um, to, you know, ensuring that people are able to vindicate their rights or more accurately, it, it frequently you know, arises as an obstacle to people vindicating really important federal rights. And the way it works is this, there's this case from the 1970s called Younger versus Harris, and it's been built on over the past 50 years. And the, the, the principle is that in a lot of circumstances, if you are involved as a defendant in a criminal prosecution um, that in some way or another implicates your federally protected rights, the federal courts aren't going to let you run to federal court and try to um, get the federal courts to enjoin your state court criminal prosecution. And that kind of core of the Younger Abstention Doctrine really has metastasized over the past 50 years. So uh, time and again, you just see the federal courts you know, using you know, the, the mere existence of some kind of state proceeding as an excuse for the federal courts to bow out and say, you know what, you're already in state court for something similar. This might come up in state court and we're, we just don't want to get involved. Um, at the same time, though, yeah, younger abstention isn't jurisdictional. Um, it's an affirmative defense that the government can raise or not as, as they want to. And what we saw in this case was just a really kind of breathtaking example of the court seeming to go out of its way to create this off-ramp for the government. Um, because, you know, buried in these thousands of pages of briefing at the district court level were, were a few references, a few arguments about Younger. But once the case got up on appeal to the Fifth Circuit, none of the government defendants were really meaningfully arguing that the Fifth Circuit should abstain, that they should kind of duck out of deciding the merits of this case. Um, it was mentioned a little bit in some of the briefing. It was mentioned in a footnote, for example. And even when the government, you know, effectively lost uh, before the Fifth Circuit panel and they petitioned for end bank rehearing, they're saying this is such an important issue. This is such an important case that the full court needs to hear it. They weren't saying the full court needs to hear it and apply younger abstention. Instead, they were asking the full court to to address an entirely different issue about you know, how state court judges and, and county court judges interact. And then for the first time a week before the end bank oral argument, the court issues a letter to the parties saying, by the way, you know, please be prepared to comment on younger abstention. And you know, ultimately, we get to we get the seventy-seven page opinion, and there's a lot in it. But one of the things that the majority does is say, you know, the government you know didn't do a really great job of 
really ever raising Younger on appeal, but we're going to overlook that and we're going to say that they haven't waived that argument. And we're going to send it back to the district court to basically resurrect that argument on the government's behalf in the first instance. So I've been talking for a while, but the one thing that really struck me as as wild about this case was this idea that the Fifth Circuit was going to go out of its way so much to rehabilitate this, you know, arcane procedural defense for the government that the government itself, you know, didn't seem to really want to press on its own behalf. And that, I think, kind of compounds the problems that we see with Younger as this, you know, way for courts to avoid vindicating people's federally protected rights. Um, because, because I mean, it's a, an especially problematic issue when you have the court you know, raising it, you know, for the government and you, you kind of have the court, you know, you know, going through these, these esoteric procedural defenses for the government and picking out ones and kind of suggesting that the government raise them if they haven't already. So, Bob, you used to hang out in the Fifth Circuit, as we said. Do, do you have a clue as to what's going on here? No. I mean, I, uh, I don't. Uh, it, 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 it's sort of – it's a really thorough discussion of all of the issues, I think. But, like, at, on a lot of them, I kind of felt like the conclusion – there was a lot of, like – this is the way the Texas constitutional structure works, and this is the way the state legislature has delegated certain authority. And the same thing, you know, there's thorough discussion of kind of the background on younger and and, and a little bit on waiver. But the conclusion is just like there was no waiver, and it follows a statement that there was minimal briefing to the panel, and I. Uh, I kind of felt like the whole opinion, um, the the whole majority opinion was sort of written as it kind of felt like an ad, not an advisory opinion, you know, a, as that term is technically used, but it felt like it wasn't really focused on resolving a specific issue, and it was uh, it, it made the opinion sort of difficult to follow. Um, and I I think one of the one of the biggest examples of that is the the section that actually remands for consideration of ab, of abstention is uh, like right around two pages, and it is sort of just a direction to the district court to consider the Supreme Court cases on younger abstention. And I, I mean, I, I don't know, I, I don't know that that clarifies anything for somebody who's trying to apply. Uh, younger abstention just to say that you should look at the Supreme Court cases. But <laughs> um, that I, I kind of had that feeling about a lot of pieces of the um, uh, of the majority opinion. There was there was one section where uh, they're trying to analyze whether uh, setting the bail schedule in and of itself is a judicial act. And they point to one uh, uh, another case where judges were setting up a pool of attorneys that might be appointed as appointed counsel and those same judges made decisions about whether to appoint counsel and the plaintiffs pointed out well this is different because you have uh you have these county judges or district judges setting the the schedule and then another set of judges actually makes the actually make the bail decision so you should you should look at setting the bail schedule as a non-judicial act and therefore um, not outside the scope of section 1983 and the the majority opinion just says this is a distinction without a difference there's no disconnect between the the judge who sets the bail schedule and the judge who applies it and there's no like i had to think about that line for a few minutes cuz i I mean, I really just did not understand what it meant, and it felt like sort of a an important part of the reasoning. Uh, and there were there were a number of spaces in the opinion that I, I got that feeling. Yeah, it's in, one really odd part is there's a concurrence, and the concurrence disagrees. It seems pretty fundamentally with some of the majority opinion, but it says, you know, it it is okay to do this younger abstention remand because this stuff is just really tricky, um, which in itself raises a lot of qu questions. Did you, did you have, did, did you have, uh, make sense of, of that concurrence, 
um, Sam? Um, honestly, not, not a whole lot. I wasn't really sure what the daylight was between the concurrence. I think it was a concurrence in the judgment um, yeah. and, and the majority opinion because what the majority basically said was, you know, we're going to introduce this whole, you know, this younger off ramp for the government and send it back to the district court. And we're not really going to opine on how that should turn out right now. And as I read the concurrence, they kind of said, we think that, you know, it's great to send this back to the district court to kind of opine on Younger in the first instance. So maybe, maybe there were some like subtle differences that, that were just going over my head. Um, but it seemed like both the majority and the concurrence were totally on board with what I think is a you know, pretty radical proposition that, you know, it's really the federal court's business to be, you know, manufacturing new arguments to benefit government litigants. Um, you know, it, it, I, th I think this case really illustrates, you know, just in the ordinary course, it's hard enough for uh, you know plaintiffs, particularly indigent plaintiffs, to be able to vindicate their constitutional rights in federal court. Right? There's all kinds of doctrines. I mean, there's qualified immunity. There's you know all of the stuff that we talk about um, you know on the short circuit podcast all the time. Um, but then things are made immeasurably harder when you have the federal courts, you know, kind of coming in with with very little notice and putting a thumb on the scale for the government on top of that and saying, you know, well, you guys missed that one argument over there that really might be helpful for you. You know, the government doesn't need the the federal courts doing that. And the dissent made that point here. You know, they made the point that Texas Solicitor General is is fully equipped to, you know, present the best arguments for his client. And it's not the business of the circuit court to be identifying, um, you know, other defenses that were not adequately developed by the government itself. So you, Sam, uh, were involved recently in an effort to get the, the issue of younger abstention and waiver to the Supreme Court. Um, do you think that this is something similar here? And would this be a good vehicle uh, to for, for the court to address that? Or is there just too much mess, perhaps? Yeah, so you're right. We we filed a, a cert petition in, out of a related issue in the Ninth Circuit, um, I think it was last year, where um, there too the government all but conceded that they didn't want to invoke younger abstention and they wanted a decision on the merits and the Ninth Circuit panel, you know, even so, we dismissed the case, I think, wrongly by um, raising younger abstention. And yeah, I mean, I think that this case raises a similar issue where you have the the, the court just you know, resurrecting the, this argument over the, the government's silence and, and really latching onto it, I, be, I think, because it looks like an easier way to resolve this otherwise really challenging case. Um, as to whether this case is a good vehicle for raising it, I mean, I suspect the answer is no, because none of us actually understand what's going on. And I think <laughs> any, it'd, be a, it'd be a hard way to, to tee this up as a, a cert petition. Um, because one of the one of the additional complications, if, if anyone is still listening to, to this podcast, <laughs> one of the additional po um, complications here is that the, the court, you know, issued a limited remand to the district court. They basically said, you know, we flagged this super cool younger abstention argument that the government really might want to press. But because nobody meaningfully developed it at any stage in the case, the district court hasn't had a, a great opportunity to flesh out the facts and flesh out the arguments on younger. So we're going to remand it back to the district court to kind of hash out this younger argument that we're really hot on. Um, but it's going to be a limited remand. It's going to come right back up to the end bank court. And because of that, what we're going to say is that unlike every other case that I'm aware of ever, um, we're going to authorize the district court not to treat any of our younger precedent as binding on the limited remand. So I, I, I if, if, if your listeners know of other cases where the federal courts have kind of authorized the inferior courts to disregard precedent. I, I would be interested in, in hearing about that. I've, I've never encountered that before. And I mean, honestly, it, 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 if, if you're, you know, a district judge who's jazzed about younger abstention, it might be kind of a cool opportunity because you can kind of, you know, act as if you're not bound by any of your circuit court's <laughs> precedent. Um, but I, I think what's going on here is that the, the, the Fifth Circuit majority wanted to make very clear to the district court that to the extent you think there's any pro-plaintiff younger precedent um, that, that we've issued in recent years, make sure that you don't think that you're bound to apply that um, and, and certainly don't view that as any kind of obstacle to ruling for the government. Yeah, it's like they're they're in the on-bank posture so they can they can just clear away all the precedent because they're on but because they can do you know what they wish in that posture. And so send it to the district court to kind of exist in this, you know no no precedent zone and then whatever the district court does is going to come right back to the fifth circuit is going to you know state what they think anyway it's just a little bit of factual uh i guess clarification that the the court's going to do in the end um 
So we will see. And when that comes back to an on banc or an on bank uh, position, uh, we here at Short Circuit will be taking close notice. Uh, and I'm sure it will make its way in a newsletter and perhaps even back on this podcast. So thank you both for your analyses today, both in the 11th and 5th circuits, um, and also for your nominations for the courtroom contest. We'll keep a close eye on that. Please please listen to this podcast at a future date for uh, where that turns up. And in the meantime, I would like to ask that all of you get engaged. Mm-hmm.